um, I'd like to also thank you for accommodating my, my requests. <coughs> So one day, my daughter, Aya, who's now eight years old, came to me and asked, so mommy, what do you exactly do? I tried to explain to her in very simple terms my subject um, of uh, expertise, so energy, environment, sustainability, not the easiest subject to, to explain for a five-year-old at the time. So she finally said, okay, now I get it, so you switch on the light. <laughs> Today, I hope I do a better job. So it all started when I was in London on the underground in one of the busy weekends, and I saw my professor serendipitously. I was set to meet him the following week to discuss my master's thesis proposal. And so we exchanged greetings, and then he asked, so are you ready for the meeting? Did you pick a topic? Is your proposal ready? And I said, actually not. So while he, were, he was reprimanding me, I was telling him, actually, I, I did write a proposal. I did some preliminary research. I did even some preliminary interviews only to discover that the topic didn't really motivate me and I didn't want to complete it. And while he was reprimanding me some more, my mind shifted to the conversation I had to myself when I decided to ditch my first subject. I said to myself, Noura, you have this one chance to write a master thesis. You, it better be something you're really passionate about. It's better be something that's worth the fight you had to come to London on your own to study for the masters and the days you spent negotiating with your dad who at the first refused to let you go uh, at the age of 19. I awoke to my professor telling me, okay, you can fix this. You come from Saudi Arabia, right? You know, they could be in trouble because of their oil. Did you know about fuel cells? I'm like, fuel what? So he scribbled, scribbled something down, got off to the next stop, and I remember pulling an all-nighter that night, and I was hooked ever since. It wasn't an easy journey, but this, ma this, this passion and mission to find out the answers became my personal quest. I moved it with me from a master thesis, which was on hydrogen fuel cells is, as a disruptive innovation to the oil industry with a, a case study of Saudi Aramco. My passionate curiosity grew with me, and I decided to take it along when I started doing my PhD. The question had become, how can Saudi Arabia, my country, respond to the challenges of climate change and sustainability? Even though I was very passionate about the subject, along the way, uh, some other priorities took over, such as getting married to my amazing husband, Amwar, having my first child, Aya, and also my late father's chronic illness and his loss of speech. So all of this has made me decide to take some time off. I decided to take an interruption for a couple of years. I moved back to Saudi with my husband. I had my first child. I spent the last days of my dying father. And then I decided that I was almost going to quit writing my thesis. So I decided that I needed a refresher. I wasn't ready to quit just yet. So I, I saw a program on international relations, which was offered between Dar al Hikma and the Fletcher School in Tufts University in Boston. I applied for the scholarship and I got it. And I decided to go with my newborn. Uh, my sister, who was very nice to come along with me, was there. I had to uh, also nurse her every, every few hours. And so she had to meet me in cafes in New York and in Boston between meetings <laughs> in a separate room. Um, but I finally did it, and I got the uh, postgraduate uh, uh, training course in, uh, in diplomacy and international relations. And it was also a nice way of getting back into the intellectual mode. It wasn't directly related to my thesis, but it was nice enough to keep me going intellectually. And so after the death of my father, I decided to go back to London and resume my PhD, only to be faced with a new set of challenges, which is that um, uh, I, had a, uh, I had been assigned a new supervisor, and I was also living as a, uh, almost like a single mom because my husband was living uh, and working in Saudi. Um, so here I'd like to pause that and commend every gentleman who supports the decisions of their wife, such as Mohammed as well and my husband Ammar. 
uh, it's not easy to to manage a, a, a relationship, uh, especially in this part of the world. Um, so uh, my, my new supervisor was an engineer, and I am not an engineer. In fact, he was the chair of engineering, and he has decided that my current thesis, my PhD thesis, as it was, did not have a contribution in engineering, but had a contribution in social sciences, which he did not think was enough. So I was faced with a new challenge of trying to find a, a contribution in the engineering field while I am not an engineer. So I took on this new challenge, and, and there it goes. I had to double my time and double my effort. Uh, even though I had planned to stay for um, a certain amount of time in London, it, it doubled that. But, but at the end, I felt like this nightmare is going to this nightmare is going to be over soon. I felt that uh, I was ready for it. Perhaps it was due to my early years when I was homeschooled uh, to attend the IGCSE, which is the International General Certificate of Secondary Education. I started doing that at the age of 14 only. And within one year, I squished in the high school studies. So the IGCSE is, is the equivalent of the high school. I was a freshman uh, in college at the age of 15 when my friends weren't even in high school. So I think this working under pressure has paid off, and I was ready to deliver uh, in, in stress, under stressful conditions. So after hours and hours of sweat and tears, I finally made it. I submitted my thesis. I went back home. I had my second child, Abdullah, who is now three. And I started my career as a professional engineer, uh, engineer professional at Arriva, the, the French nuclear energy company. Um, I defended my thesis, and I got my PhD. And shortly after, I was also offered a postdoc fellowship position at MIT. So that was the year for me. <laughs> Paying, everything paid off. I landed my fellowship in the engineering department at MIT. And only then did it make sense to me why my, my second supervisor was very keen on me contributing in the engineering field, because it served in my new position. During, during the past two years, I had to balance a small, life, a small family with constant traveling between Riyadh and Boston because I had to spend half the time here and there. Uh, sometimes I took along my kids with me. So it was absolutely crazy. I continued working for Arriva and doing the MIT postdoc. And with the help and support of my husband, I did it. And I'm, I'm glad I did. Currently, I'm a visiting scholar at MIT. And I'm continuing the research in the same field while maintaining my job at Arriva. Only this year, I hope I do less mileage and more time at home, especially with the newborn that I have, Alia, three months old. So somewhere along the, somewhere along the way, I managed to publish my, my, my first book, which is based on my PhD, Greening the Black Gold, Saudi Arabia's Transition Towards Clean Energy. So I'm going to try to summarize it or tell the story in, in three simple stories. The, f the first story is the climate change story. So the international community has placed fighting climate change as a worldwide priority. It believes that rising CO2 has caused our climate change and will continue to do so while impacting our environment, our ecosystem, and, and subsequently our well-being. But may I also add that the origin of studying climate change in the 19th century was in fact a favorable phenomenon because people suffered an ice age and wanted to find a way to warm the planet so they could grow crops for a growing population, the irony. But seriously, some people think that it's a natural cause, and some other believe that it's a conspiracy theory against oil countries. But whether, whether we believe it or not, the international community has provided this consensus that man-made rising CO2 is to blame, and that we need to curb these to survive. So this has put fossil fuels in a dangerous position. Second is the Saudi story. Saudi Arabia, which today is the world global leader in fossil fuels, uh, with the, the highest production capacity and oil reserves, is faced with many challenges. I think you all know the, the, you all know the first one, which is that uh, it's an economy based on oil. 90% of the government earnings is in oil. And uh, it's an unsustainable commodity and very vulnerable to oil prices, as we can see today. Second is a constrained fossil fuel future because of the environmental pressure. And third, it's being because it, it has been a, a rentier state, i.e. getting its money from uh, effortless uh, rents from the natural resource, the, uh, the country has a, very, uh, a relatively weak institutional setup. And, uh, and though emerging, it has an emerging industrial and knowledge base. The solution 
The solution lies in energy technology innovation and investing in building a human capital in sustainable energy, and that is the truest sustainable resource. This requires the transformation of governance from oil policy to innovation policy and assuming a system thinking approach to grow the innovativeness of the country, an institutional reform that allows all economic agents to work towards a unified vision. Sort of what's starting to happen now, especially after the presentation by Umm al-Qura, we should replicate this in other universities and make use of all, of all the universities and all the agents in the economy. So creating a national system of innovation where it's a platform to enable innovation and activate the system and manage it in a sustainable manner. This should enable Saudi Arabia to use its oil money, or what's left of it, to invest in human capacity, industrial development, to accelerate innovation in the energy sector, to be able to, to diversify the economic base and diversify also the, the energy mix. So similar to personal growth and ambition, or tumuh, a country's growth and ambition should be sustainable and should follow a clear path towards sustainability. And that is balancing between the economy, the society, and the environment. That is the best version which realizes the full potential and should drive our aspiration and inspiration. I will leave you with this quote by Theodore Roosevelt. The credit belongs to those who are actually in the arena, who strive valiantly, who know the great enthusiasm the great devotions, and spend themselves in a worthy cause, who at best know the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if they fail, fail while daring greatly, so that their place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Thank you.